Good day, ladies and gents. Welcome to this next video, looking at the design of web stiffeners of a steel beam. We're going to be calculating that to the South African Steel Design Code, so it's 10162 Part 1. This is a part of, part of the Stellenbosch University Steel Design course. Looking at the problem today, uh, we need to design web stiffeners. So the UC254254 107 column and spread a beam shown below, support a machine and sit on a concrete slab. What is the column load CU that can be applied if the stiffener and stiffener bearing um, were to govern the resistance? So here we have a column pushing down load and then we've got some beam sitting on a concrete slab or whatever it is spreading out the load and we now need to check if the stiffness and the bearing capacity of the stiffness is sufficient for carrying the load and there's two stiffness each side there two and then two each side and there's 10 by 100 mil stiffness we're going to run through all the calculations and this is you often might see sort of a steel column with a bit of a, a beam below or leg just to support load. What we'll see in this example, though, is the uh, forces we calculate are way in excess of what you would normally see such a setup um, carrying. And this would be for fairly light loads if you've got a column with a spreader beam. If you have high loads, you want to connect this to a base plate or foundation or something more solid than just sitting on... Um, sort of a, a straight floor, but it's a useful example just for illustrating a purpose. So running through the calcs, we're going to be using this. I've just printed this out, sort of a blow up of the area, so you can see what we are looking at, whether it's the side view, a plan view, or then uh, elevation, so you can see different parts of the section. But now looking just practically, here's a steel beam. And this sort of steel beam, if, for instance, we had a high point load that sat on top and some load sitting on top of this, we might get to the stage where the web itself um, is not sufficient to support the load. So what we do is we take steel stiffeners and then we weld them in on each side. And uh, that increases the capacity. Now, today we've got four stiffeners, like two each side. So it's a little bit different to the uh, exact details listed in the code, but it's also a useful thing for explaining how we might um, uh, approach such a problem. I've exaggerated the sort of cutouts at the corner. Um, these are bigger than they normally be, but this is just to show the fact that the stiffeners are not perfectly rectangular. They actually have a piece missing to fit around this curve. This is a radius where the web joins the flange, so the, the stiffener cannot go right into the web there. And uh, so we ha have a little bit less area in some of our calculations. When this is all, we just weld it up each side. You can even use different other types of stiffeners, such as angles or yeah, various elements. Coming to our cults, I've just listed some of the member properties. This is from the South African Institute of Steel Constructions Handbook, the Red Book. So I've taken those values from there, and then those are the stiffener values. It's a, a hundred mils wide and ten mils thick each. When it comes to design, we've got two ch things we're going to have to check. So I'm just going to our code now. We've got Firstly, for webs, we need to check web crippling and web yielding. So we've got, firstly, we need to know if it's an interior load or an exterior load and um, or an, an end reaction. And since because of the position of it, it becomes an interior load um, because it's a concentrated load at a distance from the member end greater than the member depth. So yes, we've got more than the member depth each side of where the load's being applied. And so we've got a, a bearing resistance. This equation from section 14.3 does not include the stiffness. So we're going to have to add that into it. And then there's a second calculation for um, web bearing resistance. Now this also, once again, this is only for when there are no stiffness. So we actually have to go then to our stiffener, bearing stiffness section and start adding in um, some other clauses. I've just highlighted a section. We're not going to run through this whole thing. And... Uh, just having a look. Firstly, 
when we um, design it, they shall be designed as columns in accordance with 13.3. That's just the section on columns. Assuming the column section to consist of the pair of stiffness and a century located strip um, of the web equal to more than 20 ty times the thickness of interior columns. I'm going to just zoom in in case you can't see that. So we need to design it, and we're going to use 25 times the thickness um, of the web as part of a column. So we're going to add the stiffness to 25 times the thickness. Um, thickness of the web, and we will then have a column to design, and um, it's 12 times if it's an end load, but we've an internal load, and also then the effective length, KL, shall not be taken as less than three-fourths of the length of the stiffness in calculating the ratio KL over R. So we need to then find an effective length, and that is 75% of the distance between flanges. Coming back to our calcs, now there are member properties. So just to confirm what I was saying to you now, we're going to design this as a column. Um, so design stiffness as a column. Inside the beam. Um, and then, if you need a reference, so this is CSANS 10162 Part 1, uh, Sections 14.3.2 and 14.4. Those are the details we were just looking at. First thing we need to also do, if we're going to design this as a um, column, we're going to check bearing. So that is... When the load is placed on it, is there sufficient uh, area, just pure cross-sectional area that the, uh, can be carried? For instance, if we've got a, uh, this is our I-beam once again. Let's say that is the width, that typical area, so there'd be some load on top here, that width. That is applied to the top of the flange, the load spreads out. And then we add on about five times the thickness of the flange each side. And we check it at a level slightly lower. And so we need to check that this area here, plus the area of the stiffness, will be sufficient. So looking at this diagram, we're saying that if the load spreads out from here, and spreads out from here, is this area, this line I've just drawn, plus the area of the stiffness sufficient? However, one problem we have is when we consider the stiffness, we're considering an effective area. So we don't have the full area here that's going to be working in terms of stiffness because we lost a little bit at the top. So our total width of the stiffener may be BV, but the effective width, BE, is just we're losing that corner. And we'll take that dimension to be this radius. Uh, and now let's get into those calculations. Bearing design check. So as I said, our bearing resistance is going to be the equation I showed you earlier in the red book, I mean in the South African code. So it's just a partial factor times our yield stress times the area this is acting over. So that's the thickness of web times by a width n, where n is going to be the loaded width, plus 10 tf, plus, then there's also four uh, stiffness, four times b the effective times the thickness of a stiffener. And for this, N is the width of the applied load on top. So that is 266.7. And our BE value, our effective width, is our total value minus the radius, uh, R1. So that's 100 minus... 12.7, giving us the width of the, the effective width. Just in case you're not 100% sure, 
where that n is. The n is the, the width of the actual load applied. So this is n here. Um, it's just coincidence that the stiffeners line up with the uh, applied load. Well, coincidence at a certain point, you normally want your stiffeners, if you've got a column fixed to the top, you normally want your stiffeners below it, such that they support the load um, as it comes down. Just as a matter of interest, if you've ever got a high point load sitting on the beam, even if your calculations show that you don't need stiffeners, I just suggest putting them anyway. If you have a small eccentricity in where that uh, load is attached to your beam, it very quickly will uh, fail your top flat. So rather just put in stiffeners to carry that load wherever you've got some heavy point load coming down onto the beam. It's just a safer way to approach the design. So now we've got our effective um, breadth. Now we can get our total bearing resistance. And we've got a slightly lower partial factor of 0.8, not a normal 0.9 um, for our interior bearing stiffeners. Our area of load and then how much it spreads out by 10 times 25 the thickness of the flange and then plus the area of the stiffness and I'm just going to multiply this whole thing by 10 to the negative 3 to convert it to kilonewtons and we have a resistance of 273.2 kilonewtons we'll round it off at the end, I mean it's not this accurate so there is now our total bearing resistance so that's just with the load coming down, that is a very high load as I said once again our structure will never get to something like that based on the way it's connected and founded and such but that is the actual capacity of those elements now we're going to move on to checking the compressive resistance, checking this as a small column So. If we design this once again, we were told that if you're going to design it, first you're going to take three quarters of this height from that position to that position there. Um, this depth, that's going to be our effective length, the L, and then multiply that by 0.75. And internally, 25 times the thickness of the web acts as a component of a column with the stiffener. If we take that and we plot that out and you run through the calculation and we do 25 times the thickness of one stiffener it's an area like that in red and then if we do from the other side it's another 25 so it's 12 and a half each side 12 and a half to the left and the right of the stiffener and we actually find that there'll be an overlap of that 25 times the thickness so we could all just design these as one unit. Uh, and then so this becomes a column shaped in this form. So that's all we're going to do now, design this column, uh, this, this highlighted red bit. F just for ease, I'm going to, to give it some uh, nomenclature. I'm just going to call that the length of the stiffener column and the height of the stiffener column, L, S, and H, S, um, to when we do the design. So that is what we're going to be having a look at now. Can that carry the load applied as a column? And in this calculation we're going to ignore this radius at the corner because now we're looking at buckling and overall behavior rather than localized bearing. At the end of the day we'll take the lesser of the two values so both of them will, are inherently checked. But now, before we can do that, just coming back, we need to make sure that this stiffener here, this outstand leg, leg doesn't experience local buckling. Because if this gets too wide and thin, you could potentially have some sort of local buckle occurring into it. So we need to check slenderness. So here's our calculations again. So we're going to design of stiffeners. Uh, plus web as a column. First we need to, to check the slenderness of the stiffener. And if that is sufficient, then we know it's not a class 4 section. And that is simply our BV over T. TV. Uh, 
And yes, this is less than our 200 over square root of Fy, which is 10.6. Therefore, OK, it's a class 3 section. So we don't need to adjust the cross-sectional area for local bucket. If, if it was class 4, then we just have to make it um, slightly smaller. When it is, um, when we're calculating the width, firstly now, the area of web acting with each stiffener is 25 times the thickness. And so this gives us a distance of 325 millimeters. And therefore, half, why I'm doing this is I'm just trying to check, is there an overlap? So yes, there's 162.5, and our spacing is 250, so 162.5 this way, 162, yes, we do have an overlap, we already knew that, but this is just a calculation to, to confirm it. That will mean this total length here, LS, this is going to be equal to 25 times the thickness of the web plus the spacing in the middle. This will then give us a total width simply because there's an overlap. If we uh, simply took 25 times the thickness and doubled it, we would actually be overestimating the area acting in conjunction with those, um, with those stiffeners. So back to the calcs. We now need to, to get those um, properties. Therefore, our length of the stiffness is given by as I showed you, 25 times the thickness of the web plus spacing. So 25 times 13 plus 250. And if there hadn't been an overlap, then we would have just designed them as two totally independent stiffeners, 575 mils. And then also the total height is simply now two times the height of each stiffener, or the width, plus the thickness of the web. So now we've got all the parameters we need for designing. So we've got the length of the total section and the height of the total section. We now can get the cross-sectional properties because we need to design this as a column, so we need our area. Um, so the properties of our column, so it's inside the um, Web, we have this column, so our area now, our total area, and this is the height in red on the next page. That's what I highlighted in red there. So our area is total length times thickness of web, and then we have four stiffeners, and we just run through the calcs to get this area. So there's a cross-sectional area we can use. Now we also need the second moment of area, second moment inertia, so we can work out our R, because ultimately we need an A and then a radius of gyration. In, um, simply by looking at normally what we'd probably do is break this down and work out the, the second moment of area of that plate, and then add on area of this one times ay squared, which is fine. Um, there's actually a one quicker way to do this, uh, that you can just avoid the ay squared term. I'm just going to design this as uh, bd cubed over 12 over the tooth over the full height, plus bd cubed over 12 of the these sections in between total. Um, it just avoids the ay squared. You'll get to the same answer. It's just slightly less calculations. Um, often with those sorts of calcs, you can simplify your life if you just uh, decide where you put the um, 
uh, which blocks and how you work it out. So our ix is uh, plus we need um, the stiffness two and there's two lines of them not two total, it's two lines I'm working on, so I'm working with a total height over 12, and so that gives me the then calculations. And uh, plus then the contribution of the stiffness And we have our total um, bend, uh, moment of inertia about the x-axis. And I'm taking the x-axis here. So this is our x-axis, just in case there's any doubt. So that's our x-axis um, through there. Uh, in the following equations, you may ask now, why are we only designing about the x-axis? Why haven't we considered also buckling about the y-axis? Because we're going to design this as if it buckles in that direction. We squash it, and it's going to move out in either direction. Um, why have we not, for instance, considered it in the other direction? Because there's our y-axis. It could buckle sideways. Or especially if it was an individual section, what happens if you designed it for torsional buckling about the Z? Some, some guidelines do that, um, so I have seen that before done. However, if you have a look at it, you've got a web that side and a web that side. For it to buckle about the Y axis, so that's along the length, it would actually have to tear away from the rest of the web. And same thing with the Z, you've got a web each side, preventing it moving and preventing it twisting. So generally these modes are prevented and you typically only need to check for the x-axis for buckling outwards, unless you had some exceptional case with very slender or big angles welded to it or something. But in the general case you only need to check buckling about the x-axis because the web restrains buckling along the y-axis or torsional, um, torsional buckling. So Coming back, now there is, we've calculated our ix. I just uh, went on a little bit of a tangent just to explain why are we only calculating ix. And then we need our r value. So this is our radius of gyration. And as I've explained previously, the radius of gyration, um, you can see it as a measure of the average distance of material from an axis. And... That just helps when you do a calculation now. You can actually look at the answer and see, is, am I approximately correct with my number? 37.58 millimeters. And yes, if we look at our section, the average material above and the average material below would probably be about 37.6 moles um, because we've got the web and the, the stiffness. Now we need to get our effective length. This is the effective length in buckling. And we need our KL value. Our K is simply 0.75. We were told this earlier, looking in the code. And then our L um, for, for design is H minus 2 times the thickness of the flange. And our total height is 266.7 minus the flange thickness, and this is a very thick flange, I mean 20 moles, it's, it's quite a uh, chunky member, and we have our 225.7 millimeters, and there we've got our KL. Now, as I said, only consider buckling about the x-axis. about x, x, axis, simply because um, uh, y axis and torsion restrained by web. So 
So you can ignore y-axis and torsional um, behavior. That means we just need to get our non-dimensional slenderness about the x-axis. So moving along, non-dimensional slenderness, lambda x. And this parameter then quantifies the influence of Euler behavior and buckling behavior. You can derive this. Um, I'm just going to fill in all the numbers. So there is our total non-dimensional slenderness, and this comes down to qu quite a low value. Now, we'd, we'd expect that because this is a very short column, so it's unlikely that it's going to experience buckling, and buckling is going to have that much influence. Simply, it's so short, it's got stiffness, so it's quite a stocky section. However, now to get our final resistance, our compressive resistance is... As per our normal column equation. So, this is the exact same procedure as normal column design, and we just have to fill in the values. And remember, it's the area that I highlighted earlier, the total area in that I showed in red. And I'm just going to write this over two lines so it's hopefully clearer. And multiply that by 10 to the negative 3, just to make sure I get a final compressive resistance. And at the end of the day, that comes down to 3,665 kilonewtons. So that is our compressive resistance, 3,365. And this is higher than the bearing resistance. So as I mentioned earlier, this is quite a short column, so we'd expect bearing resistance. Um, so thus, our value of Cu is the minimum of the bearing resistance and the compressive resistance, which then equals the bearing resistance we calculated earlier. So there's our final calculated value. However, this is very high, um, and then the overall system would be governed by something else. Would be governed by other factors, such as just the practicalities of transferring the load onto the concrete floor, how do you fix this, and all those other things. But we can see that our bearing stiffness is it's going to be more than enough for a lot of load. I mean, it's 273 cars sitting on this little footing, um, or this little spreader beam. But overall, that takes us through the, the design of the calculations, taking us through how do we get all the um, different calculations, how do we get all our different capacities for the various sections. Thank you very much.